Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Southern California PGA Education Committee. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Very excited and proud to introduce Mr. Rob Keller of the PGA Tour. As our uh, presenter this morning, Rob is a uh, PGA Tour referee and he's also a web.com tour official. Rob worked in the Southern California PGA for 10 years in junior golf and tournaments in various capacities. He was a uh, executive uh, committee member for the Junior America's Cup and also Junior Golf Hall of Fame inductee in 2005, Canadian Tour member, All-American at California State University, San Marcos. Good morning, Mr. Keller. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Good morning, John. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Rob is going to be covering uh, 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 various aspects of the uh, rules of golf, changes up at uh, 10 key points and highlights that he's going to cover. Take it away, Rob. You got it, John. Were you able to hear me there? Absolutely. Your audio is very good. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again. And uh, I appreciate everybody taking the time out of their day to uh, to be here. Um, I, I, I always enjoy the opportunity to kind of go back to my roots and, and uh, be here for our professionals there in the Southern California PGA. So I um, appreciate all of your time as well. I'd, uh, I'd really like to just try to, to breeze through a few things. As you all know, the, the changes coming up in the 2019 rules of golf, um, we're going to see the modernization, as they call it, of the rules. And um, to try to teach you all the 33 major changes that are going to occur in 45 minutes is, is not really feasible. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of hit on a few of what I consider to be maybe the more important ones. I'd like to really be able to spend some time with y'all um, talking course marking and talking the new definitions and kind of uh, potentially how it affects you at your facilities and, and being able to mark golf courses or as players what your options are going to be out of those areas. So um, I'm gonna dive right in and uh, I'm gonna to try to keep this as short as possible. And uh, at, at the end, if I can stop a little short, I'll save some extra time for questions for y'all because I'm sure that we've got a lot. But um, for any of you that, uh, that don't recall me there at the Southern California PGA, um, as John said, I was there for 10 years uh, in the capacity with uh, junior golf and our tournaments program and uh, it became very near and dear to my heart. And uh, two years ago, um, two years into this new job with the PGA Tour, I actually moved away from Southern California to Dallas. Uh, no offense to Southern California, but uh, Dallas is fantastic. So just saying. Here we go. Um, let's jump right on into modernization of the rules. And in January 1, 2019, um, that's when we're going to institute these reorganized and modernized rules. Um, there are a, a plethora of, of available resources at usga.org. Um, I would recommend that y'all, uh, I think John's got a couple of PDFs for you as well, um, be able to get the major changes, the summary of the changes, and then really a, a detailed description of the changes. Um, because what you're going to notice is the rules of golf really didn't change. Um, we're still gonna play the game basically the same way that we've played it for the past 100 plus years. Um, so as much as we think that we're uh, having to relearn the entire rule book, uh, there are some things that we do need to relearn, yes. And the verbiage has changed and um, there are a few rules changes that really you're gonna to have to take some time and absorb. However, we're still gonna generally play the ball as we find it and and move forward with the same principles of the rules that we've always moved forward. Um, so with that in mind, um, a big part of this was cleaning up the rule book. And we now have three separate resources that you're going to find. You're going to find the full rules of golf. Uh, you'll find the um, interpretations. And you're going to find the committee procedures, I believe, the third name of it. And I admittedly have not gotten into um, all three of them 
completely yet, but um, I've got four more days of competitive golf to referee in our web.com tour Q school finals. Uh, and after that, I will try to completely forget the old rules and take on the new rules, but we'll see how that goes. So um, part of this, that you'll find in here is a reorganization. They've taken the number of rules and they condensed them. Um, the index that you'll find in the full rules of golf is not nearly as intensive as what you had found before, um, but it still points very efficiently to the different parts of the book and the rules that you'll need to, to find. Um, the, the hardest part that, uh, and I don't have a whole lot of time to spend on it, but I, I want to at least mention it is um, in relearning the rules. Previously, we would teach you, um, whether it was me at the section, a USGA committee member, or somebody that was actually involved in writing the rules of golf, we would all follow these same guidelines, which is if you're going to learn the rules, you first learn the definitions. Second, you learn the rules. Third, you start to learn the decisions. And fourth, you focus on the appendix. And that's all of your local rules, conditions of competition, club and, and ball specifications, et cetera. So really, when it comes to these new rules, that's not changing. We're going to go learn the definition. And there are a lot of new definitions, skiing area, penalty area, relief area. Um, there's no more through the green. It's a general area of the golf course, which includes everything except for the team area of the hole you're playing and the putting green of the hole you're playing. Um, so it's a very, it's a very interesting um, take on modernizing the rules as they have taken the language and I think tried to really um, eliminate the lawyer speak, if you will, and kind of let it speak to the golfer. Um, knowing that the game no longer is just for the lawyer um, and that we've really grown the game and we're attempting to grow it even further. So there are some good things that have come out of that, but unfortunately in the definitions, when you go through them, you now have to relearn a lot of verbiage. Um, the full rules. So the full rules of golf are going to be this book that, uh, as you can see, I mean, it's, it's still hefty. Um, by no means are we, shorten the rules so much that you can carry this one in your back pocket, but they've also created a player's edition, which does fit in your back pocket would be the same as uh, like a yardage book. And um, those are simplified for the players. And that's what you would learn next. Um, now we're going to learn what they're calling interpretations, previously the decisions, and then the committee procedures. And so that's going to come down to y'all at the, um, your facilities as generally the head of your committees. Um, rewriting your local rules, uh, conditions of competition, how you're going to mark and define your golf courses. So really the committee procedures section is, is the old appendix, um, but reorganized in a way that's going to make a lot more sense and is going to be a lot easier for folks to get through. Um, at least we hope so. Um, so a, a big part of this are going to be these changes. Um, the main changes the rules. So as I said, the definitions, there's a lot of new verbiage. It's just, it, 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 it's a lot. I don't want to go through all of it, but what I will say is um, there are things such as penalty area. So a penalty area now is no longer, it's taking the place of the water hazard. Um, and it's going to allow the committee some more leeway on how they want to mark the golf course, because you may previously have not marked some scrubby ditches or hillsides that weren't necessarily a water feature. Um, and so you were trying to stick to the integrity of the rules. Well, now that area is going to be a little easier to mark that way and try to get a player out if it's an area that's completely unplayable um, and get them out and moving forward again. Because part of this reorganization is in modernization is to help with the pace of play. And you're going to see local rules like a ball goes out of bounds, being able to um, take the point that it crossed out of bounds and using that point and uh, a two club relief area um, where you can drop a ball back into play on the penalty of one stroke. So just like the penalty area. Um, now that's going to be a local rule that you have to invoke. That's not going to change for everybody. When you read the rules, out of bounds is still going to basically read stroke and distance. Um, but they're providing some more options in there for it. So um, what would be another big one for you? Uh, 
I think I mentioned the general area. Um, it, it, it really is broad sweeping when you stop to think about it. However, they're the same thing. The name of it may have changed, but they're really the same thing as what we've always known. Um, a no play zone. A no play zone would be the same thing as um, prohibited play, you know, what we would prohibit play from in a flower bed or an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, ESA is not in there anymore. It's a no play zone. Um, so as you can tell, verbiage wise, environmentally sensitive area, very wordy, uh, no play zone. It's pretty simple. So that's what we're after. That was what they were after. And, and um, you know, we had uh, at least a role in helping them with it um, as they rewrote these rules. But, but really our focus was the competitive aspect of the rules of golf. So um, something new in this is going to be a code of player conduct. And in these PDFs that I've provided, you'll see that it's going to outline some of these um, kind of topics of change. This is a this is a broad change. It's actually going to allow for you to, um, as a committee, create a code of conduct um, that it, that you could actually have a penalty structure for. Um, I, I can't elaborate more than that for you because I don't know what they have um, authorized as a penalty structure for that. But I do know that it opens up a, a door, not just having 33-7 where you would disqualify a player for conduct unbecoming. But it also allows you to um, treat players during the course of a competition or around equally in the sense of did the player cause damage to the course? Did he stick his putter in the green? Okay, well, we can actually have a penalty structure now for um, behavior that's out of line and not commensurate with um, the play of you know either an amateur or professional golfer. So I don't know the, the, the specifics on their guidelines for that yet, but I do know that in these rules, what you'll find in there, um, I think it's actually on sheet seven of the main changes, player behavior. There's a, a standards of conduct and uh, integrity. And we're also incorporating in this code of player conduct um, that we're, we're leaning more to the integrity of the player. And we're really trying to put that focus on um, giving the player the benefit of the doubt. And it's also still allowing us to remain really firm on judgment against the player if we have to. Um, so it's just, it's a friendlier way of putting the rules out there. And it's also a little more accountable, I think, more relevant as far as keeping people accountable because now we can penalize without disqualifying. You know, in the past, it was always kind of a slap on the wrist. Hey, don't do this again, and nothing happens. And now we'll have that opportunity. Um, okay, so penalty areas replacing water hazards. Um, I know I touched on it real quick, but uh, understand that there are still going to be red and yellow penalty areas, and you'll have those options. What's been removed from the red is the opportunity to drop equidistant. So, um, Really, your options now in a red penalty area give you one additional option to the yellow penalty area, which is the two club lengths. Um, in the committee procedures, it will outline a, a local rule to incorporate equidistance on a particular hole. So you can, as a committee, go ahead and put those in play. Uh, the equidistant option in play, if you would like. Um, what I think that this does to me is let's leave equidistant out unless it's obvious that the right side of a creek bed is unplayable, but it's marked um, as a penalty area, and the left side is in play. If the player's ball crosses on the right side and, and is dropping into nothing, that would be a great place for the committee to say, hey, we need this equidistant option on hole number three because if he hits it right in the trees and comes in on the right side, he has no option other than to go back to the tee. So that would be a great justification for um, listing that hole as a hole where equidistant is an option under the red penalty area. Um, it also, to me, takes a, a lot of confusion with the red and yellow out. Um, I know I had some discussions about uh, Mesa Verde Country Club recently, and I want to use this as an example just for their 18th hole because it's 
for those of you that have seen Mesa Verde Country Club, it's a great finishing par three. It's probably one of the tougher ones that I've seen. Um, but depending on what tee you play, the water features play differently into that hole. And so now as a penalty area, um, if you don't have the equidistant option and you play it as red, the only advantage that that gives the player is that if they cross the green side and go into the water hazard or into the penalty area, see, here you go, um, into the penalty area to the right of the green, they'll have the opportunity to take their two club relief area on that side of uh, the penalty area, the lake. Um, if you were to mark it yellow, that would be basically the same as you would proceed now. You would you would probably need a, a drop zone, an area for the player to get a ball back into play, um, maybe closer to the green, making that shot easier now considering they're playing the third shot versus their first. Um, so it's going to maybe change a few holes out there. I don't think that it's going to be wide sweeping for all y'all, but there will definitely be holes where it may say, hey, look, we used to have this marked as yellow because we didn't want the player to use equidistance and, and, and get across with the old water hazard. Well, now, as a penalty area, uh, we might be able to mark that red and give them the two club relief area, but not let them get over to the other side. They still have to negotiate the hazard. So um, there will be some new things for you all to kind of take into looking at your facilities um, or looking at facilities that you're going to run events on and um, trying to, to have a new lens to look through when it comes to the penalty area. Um, one thing you're hearing me say a lot of is relief area. So let me, let me hit on this because this is a definition that, that I missed earlier. Um, these relief areas are a defined definitive space of either a one club or a two club relief area from, from a, a point, a fixed point. So for example, when we used to take relief from an embedded ball, you would try to drop it as close as possible, as near as possible, not near the hole to where the ball is embedded, correct? Well, now that point directly behind where the ball is embedded becomes your um, new reference point. And from that point, within one club length, not near the hole, you're able to drop the ball at knee height, okay? So previously we had to drop as near as possible, but now they've opened it up and said, hey, we're gonna give you this club length relief area. Um, and we're going to drop the ball at knee height, and, and all the ball has to do is land in and come to rest in that relief area. That is that is crucial, actually, is that the ball come to rest in that relief area. Um, so, for example, an unplayable lie when you would go back on line of play and you would drop, and you're no longer dropping on that line. You're, you're picking a reference point on that line, and then from there you'll measure your two clubs out. And that could be a total of four club lengths across. So you could have the two clubs here, you have the two clubs here, and it's really this giant area that you get to take relief in under the penalty of one stroke. Um, so that part is changing. The relief area is changing. So previously we would drop a ball, it would roll a club length and a half, and everybody would stare at you as the ball in play. And you'd measure and you'd say, yeah, I didn't roll outside of two club lengths from where it first struck a part of the course. Well, that's gone. Um, as long as it lands within the relief area and comes to rest in that relief area, the ball will be in play. And that ball is now dropped at knee height. Um, there's wiggle room in the knee height, just like there was wiggle room in the, in the shoulder. So don't, don't get too caught up on it. That really didn't change, in my opinion. Shoulder height, you had this fixed. I'm just holding it somewhere up here at my shoulder. Um, we're talking some wiggle room, right? The same with the knee. Uh, all we want the ball is to be down in that general vicinity of a player's knee when they drop it. And, um, you know, I, I think that sometimes even with the old rule, it just got to, well, that, that ball was below their shoulder. Well, okay, with two inches below their shoulder, the person's six foot two. I don't think that makes a difference. Um, and that's what we've gotten to. And I will say this, um, when, when they tried to um, take – these relief areas, penalty areas, and all these things into account. It, they, the simplification and making it easier for the lay golfer to understand is what they were, were shooting for. And, and, and a ball staying in this relief area, really, when you stop and kind of, if you draw it out on paper and think about it, it makes a lot more sense that that's where the ball has to land and that's where it has to come to rest. Um, so that part 
did make more sense. Changing it from shoulder to knee, it's, it's neither here nor there. I think by dropping it at knee height, maybe you get less of a bounce. And, um, you know, at our level, we've been discussing things like, okay, well, these players are going to figure out real quick that if I go to the very edge of my club length in the direction that the ball is going to bounce away from, they're going to drop twice in place every time because all the ball has to do is bounce three inches to the left and it's going to come to rest outside the release area. They're going to do their two drops in place. So with that said, this would not surprise me in the next period or next two periods of these rules um, reviews that we're going to see that change further, but I'll leave that be. That's just kind of neither here nor there. Um, the relief area, penalty areas, if y'all want to drop those down, let's, let's beat those up at the question and answer because there's a lot of stuff that I'm sure we can cover there. Um, ready golf. Personally, my favorite, my background with playing golf, my background with our juniors there in Southern California. Um, I remember with junior golf, my favorite saying when a group is out of position is, all right, guys, ready golf, let's go. And to watch them scurry off and get playing was always fun. So um, this is no longer a, hey, folks, you're out of position, time to play ready golf. It is an encouragement through the rules to play ready golf in match and stroke play. Um, the match play verbiage is going to tell you that there still needs to be a, a hey, is it okay if I go? Um, and, and once that occurs, then play out of turn. As long as the other player approves you playing out of turn, knock yourself out, get going. Um, in stroke play, the you know, quote unquote honor system, um, there's still a recommendation of honor, if you will. And I think they spell it H O N O U R is what it is. I think that's the RNA, but um, the ready golf portion of it is, is the encouraging part of everybody just being ready to play. And if you're ready to play and somebody else isn't, knock yourself out. Is there a courtesy to say, hey, I'm going to go ahead, is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think to us in the industry, is, whether it's referees or PGA golf professionals, we really want to, we want to focus on that part. We want to focus on the etiquette and the things that make this game great. Um, and at the same time, we want the game to move faster. We want people to play. We want them to enjoy it. And we want to see them out more often. Um, and I think this ready golf, the way that they've written it in, doesn't really do anything contrary to the rules of golf. Um, you know, there's still that match play aspect of, no, I want to go first. You can always, you know, if the guy wants to go in match play, you still have the right to say, no, hey, it's my turn. I'm going to play. Um, and in stroke play, it just allows a group to, to battle through adversity and maybe get back in position when it wasn't slow play that caused them to fall out of position. Um, but it just helps in general that we're now saying, hey, look, there's not this specific order of things that people get caught up on, especially in stroke play. Um, so that's going to be something, I think, for the members of health facilities, et cetera, that, that could be uh, a nice message. Um, loose impediments in and touching sand in a bunker and in penalty areas. That's very wordy. Um, kind of old, old language there, but that's actually what it says in the book. Loose impediments in and touching sand in a bunker. And then I just paraphrased in penalty areas. Um, guess what? Leaves, pine cones. All of the old that used to be in uh, touching sand in a bunker where you couldn't touch it with your club, couldn't touch it with your hand, couldn't do anything. That's that is gone, folks. That is um, that is in the past as of January one. There are still some restrictions. There's still some things basically saying that you can't do it specifically to test the, the surface. Um, however, when you think about moving a pine cone behind the ball. Um, one thing to, to me that stuck out was how often we have to use uh, stones and bunkers as movable obstructions. They're no longer going to have to take the status of a movable obstruction. They're, they're, they're going to now be a loose impediment. Um, so we're going to take those things out now and, and kind of use a little bit of our better judgment, let's say, when it comes to maybe one of our players uh touching the pump or stand if they if they just very lightly as we've seen in, in slow-mo on some of these penalties that have been assessed where the club took you know five or six grains of sand on the way back well no that's that's not going to 
be penalized for that anymore. It's not going to be penalized to ground your club. So touching the sand or touching um, the ground in a penalty area to ground your club um, is not going to be a penalty. So it, it, it's changing the little things that, okay, uh, we've taken these rules of golf and we said, okay, what advantage did this player get from touching the sand with his club? None. Okay. So there's no penalty. What advantage did he get from grounding his club in a water hazard? Well, none. Okay. So that penalty has gone. And, and they've taken this, look at it and, and these are the effects that we're seeing. Are there more to come? I think so. But to me, this is a big one. We've all got the penalty areas. We've all got the bunkers and realizing that, you know, anything that's a loose impediment in a bunker cannot be moved um, or that touching the surface of the sand or touching the ground in a penalty area is not going to get you the two strokes that it previously did. So that to me is, is why this makes the list. It's, it's a big one. Um, procedure from dropping and playing from relief area. I kind of touched this one already a little bit, and I think I'll save the rest of it for the Q&A. But um, the big part of this is the new definition of relief area and understanding that when we're taking, uh, you know, a free relief, you get that club length relief area, the penalized relief, we're getting that two club length relief area. And um, the ball is dropping at knee height into the relief area and coming to rest in the relief area. And that's when the ball's coming back into play. So that's the big change there. Um, another pace of play initiative uh, is limiting time to search to three minutes. Um, this came to mixed reviews, but um, something that we all need to be aware of that next year, three minutes is it, that's your time. So once the player or or caddy arrives to the area where they believe the ball to be, that clock starts, and at three minutes, it's time up. Whereas five minutes, I will say that, you know, in, in our experience out there, actually a lot of times we find that ball in that three to five minute range. And it's generally because um, we've got a large group of people looking for it. Somebody steps on it. And it usually takes something pretty random to happen. Um, so I don't, I don't know necessarily this is going to affect the game. Those places those balls are lost are awful spots. Um, so for a player to lose a the ball there, have we really affected the game? Um, I don't think so, but I'm interested to see how it, uh, how it plays out. So these last three that we're going to get to, um, clubs damaged during a round. You know, you used to have the option to uh, replace a club if it were damaged during the round. Uh, that, that's basically gone. Um, you're now starting with and playing with the clubs that you've got. And um, there's a lot more into this. This is something that, that versus me trying to get into the details of um, that I would suggest as part of this presentation that y'all take a look at um, because I can't teach you all of what's in this rule in five minutes. It's just not going to happen. Um, so, as, a, as, a, as an overview of it, the thing to take away is that the club's damaged during the round. Um, you're not replacing clubs anymore. You're continuing on with what you've got. Um, and I think if you go into, I think it's in, let's see if I can find it just real quick. Here we go, equipment, damaged clubs, use of clubs damaged during a round. Um, the new rules, so this is the overview, so you can just hit it real quick. A player may keep using any damaged club, no matter the nature or cause of the damage, even if the player damaged it in anger. So currently, if it's in anger, obviously that club's gone, you can't replace it. If it was during the normal course of play, where he hit a tree on a follow through and it broke, he could have the option to either try to repair it or replace it. Those are gone. Um, if I bend my putter, I'm playing with it then. Um, if, if I break that seven iron across the tree trunk, trying to hack it out. I don't get to go get another seven iron and bring it back in. It's gone for the round, carry on, just keep moving forward. You start with 14 and you just play. And that's, I think, the, 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 the trying to simplify all of these club movements that we have because they're intense. Um, we've had some ugly ones and anybody that wants to hear about them, I think you're sadistic, but I'd be happy to talk to you about them. So. Um, it's just not fun. It, it, it's not equitable on, on some of the things that we've had come across, and I think that this helps us a lot. So, um, 
touching a line of play on putting green, repairing damage. Um, this is going to come to a lot of uh, y'all's forefront in your, I'm sure, maybe team play matches between clubs, um, the, your club championships, anything competitive, this is going to get dicey. Um, but I think people hopefully will respect what the USGA and RNA are trying to do here. You can now touch your line of play on a putting green. There's no more line of putt. Line of play covers everything from, um, you know, your line of play out of the trees back to the fairway, your line of play on the putting green to the hole. Um, line of putt is, is gone verbiage wise and it's line of play. So you're allowed to touch your line of play. You can, you can repair spike marks. You can repair um, any other, really any other damage to the green. Um, the, there are, are obviously exceptions in that that you will need to read into a little bit that are going to basically say, hey, look, they're doing anything to advantage themselves, i.e. taking your putter straight on and whacking a, a line straight to the hole. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Um, I actually wouldn't make the recommendation that anybody hold their putter down the line. I mean, I think we've all done it in the past, and you all have probably done it in the past, where when you fix a ball mark, generally you have the putter across the line that just avoids that appearance of I'm trying to do anything other than fix the ball mark. Um, that that's going to hold true now because uh, a spike mark, foot damage, um, those types of damage that we previously could not repair on the green, you can now repair. And does this help pace of play? No, in my opinion, it's not really going to change a whole lot because before you call somebody over, hey, can I fix this? Somebody would walk over, take a look at it, ask the ball mark, fix it. Um, and now it's just kind of fix the ball mark, pop it down. Somebody turned on their heel, tap it down. Um, but I can see it getting contentious between players out there regarding these rules. So that's where I would I would leave that with you all is um, definitely going to try to do this with some um, care. Um, this one's just a little bit random, but I, I wanted to put it in here um, because previously, as you all know, when you took relief from something, you had to drop the ball. Remember the A ball, B ball? Okay, well, um, a substitution of V ball is always allowed when taking relief now. Um, so taking relief from a penalty area, you can drop A ball. Uh, taking relief from an abnormal ground condition, you can drop A ball. So uh, is it really advantage anybody? I, that's maybe up for conversation. Um, but what it does is it simplifies it. Hey, look, I don't want to go in there and pick that ball up and it eliminates all of those decisions. It eliminates all of the rules about, well, is my ball readily retrievable or easily retrievable or can I just drop a new ball in play or put a new ball in play? Um, you know, the old seagull picking a ball up off of the green at TPC Sawgrass and dropping it in the water. Okay, well, you're going to have to substitute that ball and it wasn't your fault. So, but if you threw it in the water, then that was your fault, and you're going to have to take the penalty of substituting the ball in play, right? Okay, well, that, that part's it's now gone. If you're proceeding under a rule taking relief, you can substitute a ball um, pretty much at all times. So um, I'm going to take these next few minutes. Uh, I think I'm actually holding somewhat the schedule here, shockingly. Um, new for 2019 is, is a section uh, titled Course Marking. and, and and it's in this committee procedures that I mentioned earlier on. And it's gonna explain all the new areas. Um, it's gonna explain how to properly maybe mark the course under the modernized rules. You're gonna see new terminology in the section, um, such as penalty areas, keying areas, which used to be keying ground, abnormal course conditions, which used to be abnormal ground conditions. Uh, there's no play zones and integral objects, which used to be integral parts of the course. So um, it's gonna give you some guidance. And again, this might be that lens that you all want to kind of take a, a peek at that and look at your facility maybe through this new lens. What are these new rules allowing you to do? Uh, what is the new verbiage done? The new verbiage of teeing areas does nothing. The new verbiage of integral objects does nothing. They're just a new term for the exact same thing that we used to have. Um, so, you know, a no play zone now, you might actually have a header in your uh, local rules at a facility and list your no play zones 
which you know could be flower beds completely encircled by um, obstructions or um, and what used to be an environmentally sensitive area you could now list as a no play zone um, and those are things that between how you mark your course and how you identify it um, in your local rules or conditions of competition will need some tweaking. Um, for us, the big ones, we're not adopting the out of bounds. The distance measuring devices, we will have to put something in there that does not allow the use of them during competition. Um, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll list the equidistant holes that we're going to offer uh, relief equidistant in a red penalty area for at each individual golf course. Um, so that will not go on our condition of competition. That'll be individually um, identified. Uh, the embedded ball rule has been reversed. So embedded ball is now anywhere in the general area of the golf course. And that's how it's written. And it provides a um, committee guidance for if you want to just have embedded relief in closely mown areas. So that is completely the opposite of what it used to be, which was embedded ball was only closely mown unless the committee adopted the general area. Well, now it's general area and you can adopt closely mown. So you'll, uh, you'll want to take a look at that um, when it comes to those things. But I think those were the, those were really the big things on, on the PGA Tour hard card and, and on our web.com tour hard card, which we try to keep consistent with because we have players all year long um, moving between the two tours. So our consistency is really important in, uh, in those things. And I think those were really the main ones that we'd had in there. So um, I'm interested in anything that, that y'all have as far as um, what comes up in, in course marking and, and maybe how you're seeing your facilities with this new penalty area versus calling it a water hazard. Um, I can remember some facilities there in, in Southern Cal that we used to visit for tournaments and juniors that I would have loved to mark as a penalty area, but it just was contrary to the rules. Um, and obviously, we tried to stay away from that and make sure that we were playing, you know, by the, the USDA rules as written. So um, I don't think I have a whole lot more than that other than, than wanting to let y'all kind of be able to throw some questions out at me. So, John, I'm, I'm, more than happy to get into a Q&A because I think this is probably the 20 minutes is probably not enough time still to do that but um but fire no most certainly most certainly well uh yeah no we have uh, a question uh, several questions what do you recommend that we do in preparation for the three-day USGA uh rules workshop in Temecula and the second part of that is uh we have the three publications and have started memorizing the table of contents, for example? Okay, good. Um, so I would go through and I would take this earlier slide and, and I would, and I'm gonna pop back to it here real quick because this is 100%. This, is um, this would be your preparation. I would, I would take this, this uh, get those new definitions ingrained. Some of them will stay the same, but in some of, they're the same under a different term. Um, get those re-ingrained. That's actually currently where I'm at. I'm, I'm not going to move into trying to read through the entire full rules until I could go back through and tell you confidently that I've got everything in the definitions, and I don't. And um, like I said, I've got four more competitive rounds to go, and then I'm going to I'm going to be in the same position that you are with prepping for that three-day rules workshop. So um, take those definitions, get them learned. Um, I would actually, to me, sometimes just taking your full rules and kind of writing it out on a piece of paper, what the new rules are, where they're at, and maybe even just putting some notes beside it. Hey, this used to be rule 19. This used to be rule 24. Um, and that can be a great tool for, for getting your mind attuned to the new rule numbers, rule names, some of the new verbiage, um, but also realizing that, hey, the rule really hasn't in this case. Um, it's just in a new place with the new verbiage and I just need to make sure that I get that in there. So that's where I would go next. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on the interpretation. Let them go through some of that for you at that workshop um, and uh, you know, 
bulk of your time definitions and then getting into the full rules and really trying to, to um, turn the previous rules into the new rules by getting those numbers and getting those the verbiage kind of up to speed. It'd be like calling a sand trap a bunker. That's what it's going to equate to is me calling a penalty area water hazard in the middle of this broadcast. You know, it's so ingrained in there that it's just going to take time for us to to really get that verbiage right, and um, that's where I would put my effort. And uh, can you uh, can you talk a little bit about the uh, in terms of the player the code of player conduct? Um, how, how, how do we how do we stay objective in that and and and, and keep from getting subjective in that interpretation? So um, let me read, I'll, I'll read two little things on it and then uh, I'll, I'll give you kind of my take on it. Um, so the, the committee is given the authority to adopt their own code of player conduct and to set penalties for the breach of the standards in that code. So currently the player can just be dis disqualified under 33-7, but so it's gonna give us this, that ability to, to put the penalties in. Part of this other thing is playing in the spirit of the game, which kind of explains and reinforces the high standards of conduct expected from players and gives the committee the discretion to disqualify them for serious misconduct. So we're we're maintaining the ability to say, okay, this isn't in the spirit of the game, guy cheated, gal cheated, we're, we're disqualifying that player. He, he doesn't belong here. Um, but the subset of these penalties, to me, it's got to be um, – it's got to be things that we've listed probably in the past or that are easily identifiable. That it's not a gray area. It's throwing a club. It's um, dropping an F-bomb out loud. It's, um, you know, uh, like I said, damage to a golf course. It's a, a player slamming his club into the ground and actually causing damage that, that, that can't be repaired. You know, we're going to have to probably stick in the realm of, of – um, What's reasonable, like your, I, I, I believe, which is kind of like the question is asking, where do, where does that line get drawn? Um, you know, I think we need to take hard and fast look at those specific actions. You know, the yelling, the cussing, the throwing clubs. Um, you know, how you how you behave, how you treat other players. I think that's going to be the the type of of thing that it's going to have to fall in that guideline of spirit of the game where when it's not to, to our standards, we're going to have to have that conversation still with the player and say, Hey, look, this isn't acceptable. And, um, you know, it, it needs to change. And if it doesn't change, then we're going to disqualify the player, um, for that conduct and, and try to get the message across. Um, I really think that we're talking about physical actions, actual things that are happening not things that would be a he said she said or be interpreted by a, um, a fellow you know uh, player i i really think that it's um and by the way i noticed the competitors has now just been noticed the players <laughs> that's yeah forgot to mention that one that's cute um but that's match play and stroke play both um but that's where i would draw the line it's a physical action where you have something hard and fast that's where you would build your code of conduct. That's where you would build a penalty structure um, to, to penalize a player for basically acting out and acting against the, um, the general, generally acceptable behavior on a golf course for a, for a golfer. And then get into those other things, which would be, you know, stepping on a player's line, um, trash talking, whatever it might be, and, and you know, even worse than that, berating committee members, you know, fellow players, whatever it is, and, and take that to that next level where it can be discussed and you can have a little bit more of a um, little bit more leeway, but at the same time, still put yourself in a position to fix the problem. Uh, regarding uh, equipment, during a round, can we now adjust weights uh, like moving lead tape or changing loft? No, so to actually adjust the club, let me let me pull this up, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through, and uh, I'll I'll be honest, this is a cheat sheet for me. This has been my this new 2019 app is uh, is wonderful, um, and I think I'm gonna find it in the 
official guide. So let me let me read this off for y'all here real quick. So here's equipment. All right. So note three in the new rules, deliberately changing club's performance characteristics during a round. Um, a player must not make a stroke with a club whose performance characteristics have deliberately been changed during the round um, by using adjustable feature. So that would be your, your weight, the settings um, for lie law. By applying any substance to the club head, that would be your lead tape, changing all of those things. Um, the only exception to that, just as in the, in the past, would be to restore it to its original condition started in that round. And uh, Bob Madsen has a question uh, regarding definitions. Um, sure. Hey, Bob. Um, definitions verbatim correct. Under the new rules, before playing a shot, can a player, I'm sorry, under the new rules, before playing a shot, can a player touch the line of play? Yeah, so um, let's, let's go through this one more, one more quick one um, so that I can read this verbatim off to you here, Bob, but, um, so it's, it's, all places it lies. I want to make sure I get the right one. Cause this for me is the same thing as what it's going to be for y'all. I've not learned these new numbers and how they've reorganized. And even though it's supposedly simpler, um, okay. So I don't see anything that says that they cannot touch their line of play. Let me get back into, I'm going to read this back off to y'all here just real quick. Um, and this was on your sheet. Um, and I say on your sheet, have you been able to get that out to everybody, John, that uh, the two PDFs? No, um, I'm going to send that out with the YouTube recording uh, and the um, PDF version of your PowerPoint. So I haven't sent that out yet. Okay. Okay, great. No worries. Um, I just want to make sure I get it right, Bob. So I'm I'm trying to make sure I get the wording here for you. I uh, there are little things in this that I'm not real comfortable with just yet. I'm sure as all of you aren't. Um, here we go. Uh, touching the line of play, 26. Okay. Here it is. Well, current rule is a line of cut. Bob, I'm going to get back to you on that one because the, the verbiage that I'm seeing in here, line of play, is specific to putting green, and I've actually not gotten, I've actually not gotten to that. Uh, oh, here you go. No, it, it, that's still just a putting green. I, I'd like to look that up for you, Bob, and then I'll try to get an answer back to you um, because I'm not seeing that specifically in here on these changes. So it, if it's not in these changes, I would make the assumption that that is still the same as far as improving your line of play in front of the ball. Touching line of play should not be an issue, um, but improving your line of play would still be under those same things, but I, I want to double check. But that would be my 90% certain answer is that you're, you're able to touch your line of play off the putting green. You're just not able to improve it, if that makes any sense. So uh, the old ruling with the, the pitch mark in your line of play, going up and tapping that down, I don't believe that we are allowed to repair anything on the line of play that's not on the putting green. 
that were on the putting green, yes, but not on no, and I'll verify that with you. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, search time going from five minutes to three minutes, um, were factors taken into consideration other than the obvious to, to move the game along, but uh, was there any consideration about um, unfairly cutting the available search time to, to, to find a ball that's lost? Ab no, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the part of the contemplation between the RNA and the USGA, um, you know, the, the concerns that we voiced, obviously, from our side, um, you know, we want the player to have enough time to, to fairly find their ball. And, and in that discussion amongst all of the different organizations, um, you know, our representative, Steve Rentoul, who sat in that for us um, from our PGA Tour referees, um, along with Tyler Dennis um, and all of the other worldwide tours that had a seat at that table, you know, there were times where less than three minutes was thrown out. And, and basically, the, basically the argument was if the ball's not readily findable, um, how long is too long? And, you know, so that, that was kind of what was kicked around the table. And I don't think that they, they went into this with saying, hey, five minutes is necessarily too long or too short. It was, hey, we're making the effort at cleaning these rules up, modernizing them. You know, it takes us 10 minutes to play a par three. Why should we take five minutes to just locate one golf ball? Um, and so, was there consideration for the players in it? Absolutely, because I think conversation-wise, it sounded like they might have even tried to cut it shorter than three minutes and, and the compromise where they came to very much um, was taking all of those factors into consideration. Hey, are we, are we um, disadvantaging the player? Um, okay, maybe we are, but at the same time, we've also adjusted the rules to now include these penalty areas. If it's an area where we think the ball could be lost for more than the three minutes, even though it's obviously somewhere in the general area of the golf course, maybe that gives the committee the opportunity to mark that as a penalty area. Now that now the player can search for the three minutes, can't find it, and can proceed um, with relief from the penalty area. So uh, I, I think that as a whole, that that was kind of wrapped into a package. And um, you know, personally, I think three minutes is, is plenty of time. If I was playing back in the day, um, do I hustle for three minutes to try to find the ball? Absolutely. But if generally, if I haven't found my ball in three minutes, my chances are slim. So um, I would probably accept the fact that three minutes was enough. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a big change. Two minutes is a lot of time. So I'm interested to see come January 1. Now, are there any rules changes that uh, you personally are going to find uh, especially challenging in your in uh, your PGA Tour work? That comes from Ron Robinson. Double R, how are you, sir? Um, yes, as a matter of fact, um, and and I haven't even delved into it. Double R, I I really think you know for us. Um, some of the rules that are coming in are eliminating some of the question of uh, integrity of the player, you know, question of doubt. Um, TIOs, from my understanding, temporary movable obstructions, we're going to have some slight changes on those. Um, and and on, on tour, that's probably the one thing that's hardest to acclimate to are all of these temporary movable obstructions um, with the grandstands, concessions. Um, evacuation vehicles and how we treat them and different things. So to me, having learned that very thoroughly, to, to have that change, I think to me is going to be a big one. And, and I haven't even delved into it. I don't even want to attempt to um, describe the change because, I've, like I said, I'm trying to get to this last one and then I'm really trying to take in the bulk of it. Um, so now for me is definitions, learning all the changes, just trying to um, have as much background as I can. But on tour, I think the big ones for us, I mean, these, these relief area things, um, it's gonna take a little bit of time to get used to, but the dropping procedure is what I think is gonna trip up most of our players. Um, that new dropping procedure that's been beaten into their heads for so long about the old procedure that um, 
I'm afraid that's where our first, you know, mistakes are going to come, not from our referees necessarily, but from our players. And that's, um, that's something I think all of us are, are really cautious of is, you know, um, making sure that they get the ball back into play properly. The, the loose impediments and bunkers, those kinds of things, those are advantages for them now. They're things that they couldn't do previously that they now can do. Um, so, so I'm not so concerned about that. Um, but like a, a relief procedure, a dropping procedure, that's a concern because that has changed. And a player now can get in trouble for dropping that ball. It only rolls three feet, but it's no longer in the relief area. He plays it. He's now played from the wrong place. So the, that that's very much, I think, the, the biggest of concerns outside of um, trying for me to relearn any changes to the temporary movable instructions. When a local rule allows a player to drop the ball after the ball is found OB, um, is there uh, any consideration or, or a movement towards the PGA Tour adapting that? Uh, no, we will not be adopting that. Um, that I think is very much going to be, in, in my opinion, um, from a competitive standpoint, you won't see that adopted at any of those higher levels of competition. The USGA won't. Um, to your national championships, I would highly doubt that like in collegiate golf, you would see it, but I could see that at, at the high school level. Um, I could see that at a lot of the, uh, the facilities um, where you're an executive golf course, for example, you would definitely want at an executive golf course, I would think to have that in because you want these players new to the game to get out there and enjoy it and not feel like, oh, I hit it out of bounds. Now I've got to hit another one from here and I just sucked at that shot. So I'm going to suck again. Um, no, you want them to enjoy it. And, and I think that's that lens that I'm talking about. You know, you need to probably just take stock. Um, you know, at Riv, are you going to play out of bounds that way? Well, no, there's really not any bounds to play at Riv anyway. But no, you wouldn't play it as, you know, um, from that point. But I think if you went to like an Emerald Isle or Goat Hill um, Welk Resort, I remember playing Welk as a kid down there in North County, San Diego. And, you know, there were some holes where that would definitely come into play. And that would be an advantage. A player can walk up and take a drop and, and get moving. So um, I definitely do not see that in the future for the tour um, or for any of the um, worldwide golf, um, professional golf bodies. And uh, one final question from uh, Ross Marcano. Uh, identifying a ball when you know it's in a tree, but you positively identify it without climbing the tree. Okay, so Ross, I'm going to restate this. Um, so if I if I can see my ball in the tree and I can identify it, but I can't get up to it, is that basically what you're saying? Is that does that sound right, John? Yes, sir. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So that would that's gonna that's that's basically going to remain the same. If we can identify the ball, then you could proceed under the unplayable for that without having to retrieve the ball or actually get up there and get it. Um, so that's going to remain consistent with how it was in 2018. Um, that's going to be that, that same, uh, same procedure, which is as long as you can identify that that's your ball directly underneath the ball um, would be your reference point. If you're going to take your two clubs of relief area, Otherwise, you can work with your other options under unplayable at that point. But yeah, the ball would be deemed found. You could identify it. You didn't have to have anything else. Okay, those are uh, appear to be all the questions that we have this morning, and we are out of time on this morning's catalyst. On behalf of the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA, we would like to. Uh, Thank Mr. Rob Keller for his time and his expertise in presenting on the Catalyst this morning. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. I appreciate it. As usual, we will be sending out the YouTube recording for this morning's Catalyst along with a 10-question quiz and the uh, various materials that, uh, that uh, Rob alluded to during the presentation. You can feel free to use the materials in an open book format to take the quiz. Please take the quiz and return it to Sharon Kerfman at S. Kerfman at PGAHQ.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR credit for attending this morning's Catalyst. Stand by uh, for, oh, the next uh, next Catalyst will be on uh, 
November 29th with Russell Stilty uh, presenting on leadership and culture. Russell Stilty, general manager at Hacienda Golf Club. And then we are uh, penciling in another date uh, for um, 2019 incoming president, Tony Latendre, uh, in a president's message, um, either the second or the third Thursday in December. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody.